Welcome everyone. Welcome to our now webinar series for November, our last one for the year. Uh, we're gonna get started in a couple minutes. Just letting folks uh, join us. We'll be getting started soon. We welcome you to put your name and organization in the chat um, and we'll get started in a few. All right, so we're gonna get started for today. Thank you, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for another NOW webinar. Uh, my name is Latoya Skerritt. I am the program director at Immunize Nevada. I'm welcome to have my colleague Erin on that would also be assisting um, and facilitating today's programming. Thank you everyone for joining us. Before we get started, I'm gonna go over um, a quick housekeeping item. So if you happen to uh, become disconnected at any point during the presentation, you could just log back in and you'll just pick up exactly where we left off. Uh, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen throughout the presentation. If any questions come up, any um, feedback, you can add it to the Q&A box. You can also put it in the chat. Uh, myself and Erin will be um, looking over and reviewing the chat. We will get to all questions towards the end of the presentation. We have about 50 minutes for Q&A. Um, if you are interested in continuing education credits for today's webinar, we encourage you to stay on for the duration of the webinar. A survey link will populate at the closing of today's uh, programming and you'll be able to um, fill out any sort of request you have for continuing education credits. Okay, so before we begin, begin, I just want to share a disclaimer. Uh, Immunize Nevada's now webinars are made possible by the generosity of speakers who donate their time and expertise to benefit the coalition. The expectation and goal is for community partners to be able to gain knowledge on immunization and infectious disease related topics. Through a non-branded unbiased presentation, the opinions that are expressed are those of today's presenters and do not necessarily reflect those shared by Immunize Nevada or its partners. Uh, next slide. Okay, so today we have an amazing presentation for you. Thank you, Dr. Chandra Puri. Also, thank you, Katie Thompson, that is on. Um, Dr. Anita Chandra Puri is a pediatrician and associate medical director of the Northwestern Medical Group Pediatrics in Chicago. Illinois, Dr. Chandra Puri is also an instructor of clinical pediatrics at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine, and a teaching attending at Lurie Children's Hospital. She received her doctorate of medicine from Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine in 1995, and completed her pediatric residency at Northwestern's Children Memorial Hospital. Her professional interests include immunization education, Pediatric Public Policy and Medical Journalism. She is a media spokesperson for the American Academy of Pediatrics and has served in various capacities with the AAP Illinois chapter. She's currently serving as the Illinois American Academy of Pediatric Immunization Representative and on the Executive Community Committee. And Dr. Shandra Purvey also chairs the Seed Foundation, a nonprofit scholarship foundation serving Indian high school students. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Shandra Puri. We also have on today, Katie Thompson, a Meningococcal Disease Advocate and Survivor. So we are uh, welcome you too, Katie. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are very excited for today. Uh, all of our attendees will learn about Meningococcal Serogroup D, Men B Disease and Vaccination, how it presents, how it is transmitted, vaccination rates and awareness, the vaccination perception gap, patient profiles, and recommendations on how to have the MENDI vaccination discussion. So we're excited 
to jump in today's uh, topic, I am going to uh, hand it over to Dr. Chandra Puri and Katie again. If there are any questions that come up, please put it in the chat, please put it in the Q&A, and we will get to those at the end. Thank you again, um, Dr. Chandra Puri and Katie, to share your screen. All right. Thank you for inviting us. Can you see my screen fully across your... Yes, I can see a screen. All right, fantastic. So like uh, was already introduced, Katie is a meningococcal disease advocate and a survivor of meningococcal disease. She's not a healthcare provider, but this is her fantastic story in her own words. Uh, she and I were both compensated by GSK for our participation today. Remember, this is one person's experience. Other people's experiences with meningococcal disease may be different. Um, Katie, I want you to just tell me as you want me to advance your slides. That would be great. Thank you so much. Um, go to the next slide. Never give up. That's been my approach to life since day one. And I must say it served me well and may have even saved my life a time or two. Hello, my name is Katie. I'm a mother, wife, artist, and advocate. I'd like to thank GSK for sponsoring me to be here today to share my story with all of you. When I was a young girl, I was strong and ambitious. I played every sport I could, and I thought of myself as a leader. I was never afraid to speak in front of a room full of people or be the person to say what everyone else was thinking. I always wanted to win, and I promised myself I'd never give up on any challenge. My tenacity off the field came through in my passion for writing, political science, and theater. At the end of my high school experience, I was a three-sport athlete in volleyball, basketball, and softball, and headed to my dream college. Next slide. When I was a freshman in college, I had everything I ever wanted. I had my entire future in front of me, good friends, good health, family, and a great education. But as we all know, life can change in an instant, and for me, it did. One day after a light workout at the campus gym, I stood up from my dorm room desk to awful pain in my back and legs. It was so bizarre. I used to dive for line drives and turn out double plays on the softball field, and I was equally as tough in the other sports I previously played. So this didn't make much sense to me. An MRI showed I had somehow herniated the disc between my T12 and L1 vertebrae and it was compressing 60% of my spinal cord. After more conservative measures failed, I, and I began losing strength and function in my legs, I had to have surgery. It was a freak injury, but I was young and healthy with expectations of making a full recovery. Next slide. Two weeks later, I was cleared to return to school. One evening, I went to retrieve some notes from a friend's dorm and came down with the worst headache I'd ever had. I went home to my parents that night and that decision probably saved my life. I was totally convinced that I was going to wake up the next morning and be fine. By morning, I could barely move or speak. I couldn't lift my head and I was in the most incredible pain I had ever felt. I was so confused and I called for my mother, a former emergency room nurse of 25 years to help me. She took one look at me, recognized the symptoms of meningitis and immediately called 911. I remember being coherent on the ambulance ride to the local hospital, but after that, I only recalled bits and pieces. I was transferred to a larger hospital about an hour away and my friends and family were genuinely concerned about whether or not I would even make the ride. Next slide. The next six weeks were absolutely horrific. Thankfully, some of it is a blur, but unfortunately other parts are not. My brain and body were burning from the inside out. It felt like someone had lit all of my nerves on fire and there was nothing I could do about it. I would wake in confusion and scream in pain and distress before even opening my eyes. I couldn't even lie still on the table long enough for the nurse to place my peripherally inserted central catheter or PICC line. Test confirmed I had contracted bacterial meningitis. I kept fighting hard, but after a few days, my breathing started to slow. Things were not going well, and my parents were told to prepare for the worst. Doctors wanted to transfer me to the ICU and place me on a ventilator, 
but that meant my family could not stay with me. I somehow grabbed a moment of half consciousness and begged to let me stay with my family. I was terrified, but I was going to fight until the bitter end. I felt that while I was here on this earth, I was going to give it all that I had to survive. Next slide, please. My mom sat by my side for hours telling me, breathe, Katie, breathe, as I drifted in and out of consciousness. I already knew how bad my condition was and I didn't want to be alone. Still, I refused to give up, not until my last breath. As luck would have it, I somehow made it through the night. There was still a long way to go. I was still on bed rest and couldn't lift my head above 10 degrees for weeks. I had to be fed, bathed, clothed, everything had to be done for me. My long curly hair was so damaged that it had to be cut off. It was the most dehumanizing and excruciating experience I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. I had barely heard of bacterial meningitis before this, and now it dominated my every waking and sleeping moment. I remember lying trapped in that hospital bed, looking up at the ceiling and thinking, when I get out of here, I'm going to do everything I can to help prevent others from having a similar experience. I eventually came to terms with the diagnosis and knew that there was going to be much more to this process than a physical recovery. My friendships and relationships would be affected by this, and I knew my life would never be the same. Next slide, please. My world quickly moved on, as did my family and friends. I felt like my reality of being a perpetually housebound sick girl was too serious for others to deal with. The highlight of my days were visits from my home health nurses and therapists. I felt so alone. Now that the, now that the ordeal was over, the heartbreak could finally set in. Excuse me. I eventually recovered by throwing myself back into my college life to resume my studies. I returned to school only a few months after my final surgery and transferred to beautiful Charleston, South Carolina, where I had a fresh start waiting for me. I worked hard, held internships, and started my career as a nonprofit arts professional. A few months before graduation, I discovered I needed a four level spinal fusion due to my weakened original injury site. And suddenly I was terrified all over again. However, I had been here before and I knew I had a life to get back to. The surgery was successful and I worked hard at my recovery and healing. By the end of the year, I crossed the graduation stage despite every obstacle I had faced from the very beginning of my collegiate journey to the very end. And that's me right there. <laughs> Next slide, please. I was still wearing a thoracic lumbar sacral orthos orthosis or TLSO brace in the few months following my spinal fusion surgeries. During this time, I met my husband who somehow saw that tenacity and passion I had beneath that giant TLSO brace. We married in 2011 and I was in the best shape and health of my recent life. We enjoyed these years together in our woodworking shop and I further developed my voice as an artist. I didn't know if I would always be that healthy but I took advantage of every minute I could. We discussed my health. I told him that even though I was okay at that time, I might not be down the road. I might experience migraines, fatigue, chronic pain, and that we should be prepared for that. Next slide, please. Sure enough, one morning in 2013, the burning pain and severe headaches returned. Scan showed nothing new or unexpected but I will always have to live with the long-term damage from my meningitis, as well as my history of spinal injuries and surgeries. However, one thing has remained constant in all of this. I haven't given up. Next slide, please. I'm very fortunate to have accomplished so many things in the 18 years since I battled meningitis. A few are of, a few of these things are things I didn't realize I could make come true. 
I met my wonderful, wonderful partner, and we now have two beautiful children together. Professionally, I've had the privilege to work in the advocacy and public relations fields for more than 15 years. As an artist, I've designed exclusive collections and exhibited my work around the globe. I've published two children's books and I still volunteer and enjoy raising awareness for important causes. As a writer, I've interviewed and shared the stories of hundreds of amazing people. Next slide, please. I decided early on that I was not going to be a victim to meningitis. Instead, it was going to be my tool, the rock of faith in myself and in that which is good in this world. I've seen miracles happen because I am one. This has been like climbing a mountain for me. I might lose my footing every so often, but I know I just need to keep climbing. My children and husband have been a great support system for me. My husband is a great caregiver for us all and is absolutely wonderful. This has been such a long journey and it has made me so much more compassionate. Seeing the beautiful exchange that doctors, nurses, and others who dedicate their lives to helping people like me have with their patients, I can't help but think of what an honor it is that I'm still here. But being here today, sharing my story with all of you is a dream come true. It's not a dream I thought I wished for, but it's so much more than that. This is about everyone who didn't make it. It's for every family that has been affected by this disease, whether they lost a family member or have lived through the, lived through the destruction of what this disease can bring to people's lives. I want to do this for other survivors out there because I know I am one of the lucky ones. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, I think Katie's experience really will highlight to you the situation where, you know, it, it she could have been your sister, your friend, your neighbor, an everyday average person that you see in high school doing their thing who was uh, um, affected by this disease that we don't hear of that often, but you can see how it can affect somebody so, so distinctly. Um, so thank you, Katie, for your time. Um, like I mentioned before, this was her personal experience with meningococcal disease. And now we're going to talk about a little bit more generally about meningococcal serogroup B disease and a meningococcal group B vaccine. And just to highlight again, I want to thank GSK for bringing us together here today um, and uh, to let you know that um, GSK is committed to transparency of financial relationships with healthcare professionals. Um, we'll be talking about meningococcal disease caused by Neisseria meningitidis, how it presents, how it's transmitted, vaccine rates and awareness, the vaccine perception gap, patient profiles, and recommendations on how to have the meningitis B vaccination discussion. Now, your adolescent patient, I'm sorry, I'm trying to move the screen here a little bit. There we go. Your adolescent and young adult patients may be at risk for meningococcal disease. And I don't know if you've ever seen a patient with meningococcal disease in your clinical experience. I um, personally, when I was a resident uh, some 25 odd years ago, I was working in the emergency room at my children's hospital and a late teenage girl came into the emergency room feeling awful, looking very, very sick, high fevers, purple rash covering her body. We didn't know as residents what was going on, but our attending physician did know, whisked her away to the ICU. And indeed she had um, meningococcal, bacterial meningococcal disease. She stayed in the ICU for three weeks in our hospital and then was finally discharged home. I don't know what her long-term sequelae are, but I do know that all of us were terrified that we had just been exposed to her. And all of us as residents had to be put on um, antibiotic prophylaxis and be observed for any signs or symptoms of meningococcal disease. Now, historically, you may know that there are five different serogroups which have caused a majority of the cases of meningococcal disease in the United States, serogroups A, C, W, Y, and B. And there are two different vaccinations which can help protect our patients against these five vaccine preventable serogroups. One vaccination currently is against 
serogroups A, C, W, and Y, and there is another vaccination against serogroup B. Once symptoms appear, can you think, how many hours does it take for meningococcal disease to become fatal? Now, I realize we can't have an interaction question and answer session back and forth, so I'm going to flip to the next slide. The options are up to six hours, within 24 hours, 36 to 72 hours, or 72 hours to one week. And for those of you who think the answer is 24 hours, you are correct. Although meningococcal disease is uncommon, once symptoms appear, the disease can progress rapidly and is potentially fatal. And really, this is the story. In as few as 24 hours, the symptoms of meningococcal disease can sometimes progress to death. That alone is what prompts so many of my patients to say, absolutely, let's get the vaccine. Absolutely, let's do it. I realize, we all realize it's not as common of a disease as, let's say, some other um, things that you're hearing about in the community now, but the fact is that it can become very rapidly fatal. Among those who contract meningococcal disease, 10 to 15% will die from the disease despite the best antibiotic treatment or the best hospital care. That's one in 10 individuals. That's a very scary statistic. And of those who survive, somewhere between 10 and 20% will go on to suffer permanent consequences like seizures or limb loss or kidney damage or hearing loss, um, skin scarring, brain damage, persistent pain issues. If you look at the pictures down the side of the slide here, the top picture is a picture of amputated digits. The next two slides are of purpura um, or that classic purple rash we worry about with meningococcal disease. <laughs> In terms of the way this disease progresses and how the symptoms present, in the first eight hours, the symptoms can be very similar to a common influenza type of illness, a headache, sore throat, cough and cold, thirst, aches, fever. In the next four hours, decreased appetite, nausea, vomiting, leg pain, irritability. In the next eight hours, drowsiness, difficulty breathing, diarrhea, neck stiffness, or the classic um, meningismus that we think about, cold hands and feet, photophobia where the lights are bothering you, and then an abnormal skin color, whether it's modeled or going on to progress in the next four hours to the purpuric purple rash, confusion, delirium, unconsciousness, seizures, and death. So this is sort of a mock-up of how this can actually affect a child or an adolescent within 24 hours. Now, a lot of times people think about bacterial meningitis as a disease of college-bound or military-bound um, adolescents. It's not. It's about the behaviors in general that adolescents participate in that put them at increased risk. Social behaviors in adolescents and young adults, like intimate behaviors, kissing, um, living in close quarters with each other, whether it's in sorority houses or dormitories or military barracks, coughing on each other, sharing food and drinks and utensils, being out at clubs or bars together, even if one person is in college and one person is not, they're all in the same space then suddenly when they're out at a bar together. Certainly there are other risk factors like an impaired immune system can put you at increased risk. And then other factors like smoking and secondhand smoke or preceding respiratory tract infection that dampens the immune system. All of those things would put a patient at increased risk for contracting and developing meningococcal disease. <coughs> Some people actually carry MenB, but never show symptoms of or have invasive disease. That's because the uh, bacteria is actually carried in the back of the nose and throat. And the carrier state prevalence is somewhere between 5 to 10% of the population. And this incidence actually peaks in the adolescence and young adult time period. Excuse me for one second. I feel like I have to cough. There we go. I apologize. It's the season of illness. Um, invasive disease is an infrequent consequence of nasopharyngeal carriage, though, fortunately. So people can carry it in the back of their nose and throat, but the risky behaviors in the adolescent time period put them at increased risk for contracting the disease. Which serogroup do you think has caused the most meningococcal disease cases among adolescents and young adults between 2015 and 2019? Again, we can't interact, but the options are serogroup A, B, C, or W. And if you think the answer is serogroup B, you are absolutely correct. Serogroup B has caused the majority of meningococcal disease cases. Among adolescents and young adults age 16 to 23, serogroup B has caused 60% of all the meningococcal disease cases from 2015 to 2019. The other um, cases were caused by serogroup C, W, Y, or other non-groupable subtypes. 
And we, if we look at the changing epidemiology of meningococcal disease in the United States, on the left, we have the incidence of serogroups A, C, W, and Y combined. And on the right, we have the incidence of serogroup B. The dashed line represents the older time period. The solid blue line represents the more recent time period. The incidence of serogroups A, C, W, and Y peaks somewhere between ages 17 and 21, 22. And we see that that incidence has come down nicely in the past couple of years. However, if you look at the incidence of serogroup B, it peaks between ages 18 and 20, and that incidence has not actually had a, that same decline in the past several years. And this combines the different serogroups together, and you can see that serogroup B comprises the majority of cases of bacterial meningococcal disease in the United States. MenB was responsible for what percentage of known U.S. university outbreaks from 2011 to 2019? Your choices are 60%, 100%, 85%, or 99.5%. And if you think the answer was 100%, you are correct. Men B has caused all known U.S. university-based outbreaks from 2011 to 2019, involving 13 different campuses, 50 cases, and two deaths among a population of approximately 253,000 students. So in terms of when you think about where or who needs to be vaccinated, it's not just in one location of the United States or one area, it's really all over the country. And according to CDC data from 2014 to 2016, 70% of the 60 men B cases that occurred among college students were sporadic, so not outbreak associated. So it really is something we have to think about in all settings. Men B vaccination rate among adolescents and young adults is still estimated to be low. As of 2021, coverage of at least one dose of a men B vaccine among 17 year olds was only estimated to be around 31%. We all know that unfortunately with the onset of COVID, a lot of adolescent vaccination rates fell as well. So this may actually be lower today than it was and at the end of 2021. So what is shared clinical decision-making? Using your best judgment to decide if a conversation is necessary, telling your patients they need to get vaccinated, making an individually based and informed decision between yourself and the patient or parent, and conveying the dangers of men B by only handing patients a pamphlet. If you think your answer should be C, making an individually based and informed decision between yourself and the patient or parent, you are correct. ACIP recommendation for use of meningococcal B vaccines for people aged 16 to 23 years is based upon shared clinical decision-making. The CDC recommends that men B vaccination be given to adolescents who are at routine risk. So Katie, for example, age 16 to 23 years, preferably age 16 to 18, based upon shared clinical decision-making. Having a conversation with your patient or parent about what meningococcal disease is, how it's transmitted, how rapidly it pro and progress, the sequelae of the disease, and then the, you have a vaccination to protect them. The CDC, AAFP, and other groups emphasize the importance of vaccines for older adolescents, and that's really important because it really puts in a platform for us to have this discussion with our older adolescents about vaccines that are appropriate for their age group. Um, you know, we all, in practicing in various states, um, there's certainly a call to see your pediatrician or your healthcare provider entering certain grades, but it's nice because towards the tail end of high school, there's also these really important vaccines to discuss with our patients. And the CDC has made it a point to um, encourage healthcare providers to do that. Are you having conversations with your appropriate patients about MenB vaccination? Um, according to a 2021 CDC survey, only 31% of 17-year-olds have received at least a dose of a meningitis B vaccine. If you compare that to perhaps the other meningitis vaccine, that's, that um, coverage rate is much, much higher. And yet we know that meningitis B, vac meningitis B disease is much more prevalent in the United States. It's critical to initiate and actively engage patients and parents in a shared clinical decision-making discussion specifically focused on men B vaccination. And it starts with identifying appropriate patients. We're going to go through some patient stories now, and I want you to think about whether or not these healthy teens um, are seen in your office and if you think that they should get the meningitis B vaccine. So Max. Max was a shy 12-year-old who loved football. He wasn't a natural athlete, but he had focus and perseverance and became a star player in high school. 
at 16 came into the office with bronchitis and you briefly mentioned men be vaccination at the end of the visit. His mother told you of his intent to attend college. In his sophomore year at college, he was devastated because he sprained his ankle badly and could no longer play football, but he's still happy at college because he joined a fraternity and is excited to live in the frat house. What's next for Max? We can't be certain, but we can be certain that these elements of Max's lifestyle put him at increased risk. He attends college, so there's living situation, living in close quarters with others in fraternity house, and his age. <coughs> Lily. Oops, sorry. Lily was a sweet, chatty 13-year-old when she came to your office for her first visit. You saw her two years later for a long overdue checkup, and you could see that she was more physically developed. At 16, she comes to your office and shares that she's actively dating. You ask her if she smokes or uses alcohol. She says she doesn't drink much and only vapes and shares e-cigarettes with others at parties. Now Lily is living at home after high school, but still manages to party with friends while working as a waitress and a clerk at a nearby inn. She's considering a career in the hospitality business. What's next for Lily? We don't know, but we do know Lily's at risk for men B because of these behaviors. She's intimate with people. She attends parties. She vapes and shares e-cigarettes, all putting her at increased risk. Gabby, you vividly remember when Gabby came in for a visit and sang a song from a school production. She was fantastic and you could tell she loved it. Gabby is 16 and in for a checkup. She wants to be on Broadway and tells you of her intent to move to the city after high school. She knows that will mean sharing a small apartment with multiple roommates, but she's up for it. What's next for Gabby? Again, we can't be sure, but we are sure that Gabby is at risk for men B because of these factors. She's planning to live in close quarters with others. For example, having multiple roommates in a small city apartment. So do some of these patients warrant a men B conversation more than others? No, all of the patients at their 16 to 18 year old visit should have a discussion to arrive at a shared clinical decision about the need for men B vaccination. And I'm sure you can identify patients like this in your practice as well. Your vaccination recommendation is the most important factor in your patient's decision to get vaccinated. And that's why I applaud all of you for actually finding out more and more about the men B vaccination. I want you to think about how you're going to approach your shared clinical decision-making conversation because we know that your conversation is the most important way for patients to find out about their healthcare needs. Um, provide clear and consistent vaccination information. If you know your information, it's up to you to educate the patients and their parents. Unfortunately, if they don't know anything about this vaccination, they don't know to ask for it. And like Katie, a lot of people don't know about meningitis and they don't see it commonly. And so they don't think that it can affect them, but we know that it can affect an individual just like yourself or just like any of your patients. Take time to address questions and concerns. You know, I feel like we have so many things on our plate when we are having our conversations with our patients about what they need to do. But I think having a very specific sort of strategy for how you address vaccination questions is really important. Giving time to your patients and parents to ask their questions and respond appropriately is very important. It's the best way we have of educating our patients is to actually listen to their concerns. The key facts to remember about meningococcal disease, although it is uncommon, it can lead to death in as few as 24 hours. Up to one in five survivors suffer from permanent consequences of having had meningococcal disease, and the disease can spread through certain behaviors such as kissing, smoking, sharing drinks, and living in close, close quarters, which almost all of our patients will be involved in. I want you to think about the opportunities you have to have the MenB conversation. We know that adolescents don't come in that often, particularly for wellness visits. So you want to use every opportunity you have with your adolescent patient, whether it's when they come in for acne before prom or a sprained ankle. You want to think about having the MenB conversation then so that they know about this vaccine. And that is our slideshow and our talk for today. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I think you're supposed to put your questions in the chat and um, we'll be able to have a further discussion. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chandra Puri. Thank you, Katie. Um, I'm just going to give a couple minutes for folks to uh, put their questions, comments, feedback um, in the chat or also um, in uh, the Q&A.
But we have one comment, amazing presentation, very informative. See if we have any uh, questions for Dr. Chandra Puri um, or also Katie. Katie, thank you so much for um, partnering, with, partnering with us and also um, sharing your um, experience. I'm really, really um, thankful for that. Important information, important point of view. Um, so I thank you for your, your vulnerability in sharing. Um, we do have a question. Let's see. Uh, so there's a question on current recommendation for adult men immunization. So the current recommendation by the ACIP is to immunize between ages 16 and 23 for meningitis B. And that, again, is because the peak incidence of illness seems to be between ages 18 and 20. This vaccination against meningitis B is currently um, licensed for ages 10 through 25. But the recommendation specifically is for ages 16 to 23. Thank you. Um, we have another question as to what is your suggestion to help increase the vaccine rate since COVID? Well, I think, first of all, you got to bring your patients back into the office. I think that this is an age group that there's so much to talk about. I mean, in my practice, we have annual visits regardless of what is required by the schools because we really think it's important to go over physical health, mental health. Um, blood pressure, weight issues, diabetes risk, vaccination needs. And most pediatricians or family medicine um, practitioners are used to know, you know, thinking that vaccines are in the kind pre-kindergarten age group, in the young adolescent age group, but they don't think about them in the older adolescent age group. And there are so many vaccines out there that are important for this population. So I think it's always a good idea to get people into the office, not telehealth, but to actually get them into the office at least once a year for a wellness visit. And to bring up the concept of future vaccinations earlier in their lifetime. So for example, most patients are having to get a quadrivalent meningitis vaccine at either age 10 or 11 entering sixth grade. That's the time I talk about how there's the fifth strain of meningitis that I want to protect their patients against further down the road so that they know that there's something coming up. Um, conversations about vaccination are constant, that you just have to keep talking about them so that people have a chance to think about their questions, have an idea about what they want to ask, and to get used to the idea that there's more vaccines to come. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Why do we only require MCV4, and how is that similar to men B? Um, so... Requirements are by state, and there are some states that actually require one MCV-4. There are some states that require two MCV-4s. There are some higher education institutions, college institutions that require men B vaccination. It's very hard to make a vaccination requirement in the setting of the number of cases that there are. We know that there's somewhere between 250, 300 cases of bacterial meningitis in the United States per year. So it's very hard to mandate a vaccination. However, we know that on an individual basis, the vaccine is very protective and very helpful. And like Katie would say, if somebody could have given her the vaccination, she would have been probably pretty happy to have received it. Even if she knew that a hundred people weren't getting ill, she was ill. So it would have protected her. So that's where the sort of individual recommendation has to come from. There are some legislations, legislatures in states that are discussing making the meningitis B va um, vaccination mandatory because that is the number one cause of um, bacterial meningitis. But the political climate of the United States is such that mandating vaccination is a very difficult thing right now, particularly coming off of COVID, particularly coming off of the strategies to get vaccinated for that, to even implement a you know, flu vaccine strategy. So there's a lot of controversy about mandating vaccines. Um, so while I would love to have it be <laughs> mandatory, it's very hard to make this happen. It requires a lot of attention from each individual state and the vaccine stakeholders in each state to really come to the table to talk about how important it is. But I, you know, I don't know what state you specifically are from, the individual who asked the question, but you can certainly talk to your um Academy of Pediatrics representative um, and see what they're doing. You can talk to your Department of Public Health and see what they're doing. Um, and if there's any way that you can help make that happen, that would be fantastic. 
Thank you. Um, you mentioned um, getting patients back into the office. How have you found that? Have you found that to be challenging? It, like, like how have you found like patients coming back to the office and being able to have those conversations in person? You know, I mean, I, I know that in 2020, we definitely were focusing on our younger patients coming in and not having our, our adolescent patients come in, but life has kind of returned to normal in terms of my practice, in terms of having people come back in. I mean, sports are back to normal. Children need sports physicals to be cleared to play. Um, so for the past, I would say two years, it really hasn't been as much of an issue getting adolescents back in the office. And we in particular make a point of not doing telehealth appointments anymore because we just don't find that they're as useful in our population. So I think you just need to open, you know, really talk about how they need to come back in and, and be seen because there are so many things to discuss with our adolescent patients. Um, another question, have you found any um, complications in regards to um, um, uh, insurance and documentation of diagnosis in regards to um, families being able to uh, receive vaccination or if you are aware of any of um, complications around that as like a barrier to um, no, having like I mean, oh, the fact that it's, yeah, it's a shared clinical decision-making vaccination recommended by the ACIP. It's covered by VFC. Um, there's really no barrier to insurance coverage for the vaccination. In fact, it is nice that it is covered by VFC because I think I was reading somewhere recently that somewhere around 50% of our nation's pediatric population is covered by VFC. Um, and uh, we never want a patient who ages out of VFC to be stuck in a situation where either they don't have insurance or they don't have VFC and then they can't afford to get a vaccination. So you really want to make sure you vaccinate your patients before they age out of VFC. Thank you. Um, you have another question. Do you feel that cross-educating on meningococcal and HPV increases the chance of patients getting both? Um, and do you, do you believe that if one or both uh, vaccines are required, that the HPV vaccine rate therefore also will go up? Like if there's a correlation there in your experience? Well, I think, I mean, you can look at vaccines that are required. Tetanus vaccine is required. Um, you know, the rate of vaccination against tetanus is much, much higher. Measles vaccine is required. I mean, any vaccinations that are required, the rates are much, much higher. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's the right thing. Um, I think that it's very hard for parents to wrap their minds around mandating vaccines in the adolescent time period. Um, and so I, I, you know, again, I feel like I do what I do because I'm, I'm doing it from the perspective of it's the right thing for the patient's health. I don't do it just because it's a requirement. And I think that's really where I talk to my patients about how I'm recommending this because I know it's good for, because I have read and believe and understand that it's good for their health. Um, and, um, I don't do it just because it's something that's required for school. Um, and then I also, I treat the vaccines that are required for school and the vaccines that I know that are good for their health in the same, like in the same way. I, when I see in, in the state of Illinois, they're required at age 11. I just tell them, okay, you are required to get, or the way I phrase it is today, you're here for your 11 year old checkup. I'm going to be giving you your tetanus vaccine, your meningitis vaccine, and your HPV vaccine. I say it all together. And then I talk to them about how there will be a meningitis B vaccine for when they're older adolescents. But I just, I don't, I don't necessarily ask them about the vaccines that they want. I talk to them about what I'm recommending. Thank you. I'm going to give a couple more minutes, see if we have any other uh, questions coming in, in the Q&A and also the chat, if you have any questions. Um, or a uh, feedback uh, for Dr. Chandra Puri or uh, Katie. Uh, I'll give a couple more minutes uh, so that we can get to your questions and uh, comments. And I apologize for my coughing fit in the <laughs> middle of it all. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good.
Katie, thank you also for your sharing your story. I think it's really Im important for people to identify with somebody who they feel like could have been their, their neighbor, their sister, their friend, and to see how something you just could totally change your life. Um, and that there's something that we could protect you against or protect other people. I'm certainly, certainly sure you're going to protect your children against everything you can. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Katie. I'll, I'll give the floor if you want to have like a couple of final remarks, um, Katie, before uh, we see if there's any more questions. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share my story. And like you say, meningitis might be rare, but when it's happening to you, that it's your entire world and the impacts can be devastating. So um, it's important for me to share my story. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, I don't see any more um, questions coming in in our chat. These are some really good questions that came forth so far. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Sandra Puri and Katie um, for giving us your time, your expertise. Um, we really appreciate you partnering with us. A very important, like you said, conversations to continually having. Um, you provided a lot of like techniques just to have that conversation, which I think is really, really um, important. Um, so Again, thank you both. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, I just want to remind everyone that was on for today's webinar. Um, if you are looking for CEUs for today, uh, stay on till the end. Um, once the webinar closes out, you will be able to um, fill out a survey that will auto-populate uh, for your CEU credit. Um, we will be providing some information regarding today's webinar. This is our last one for uh, 2023, but we hope to see all of you again in a new year, 2024, um, where we could continue this partnership and these conversations. Thank you, everyone that's on today and continues to be on our uh, listserv. You will get any updates that we have regarding additional programming. Um, and I want to wish everyone just a safe and happy and connected um, holiday season, however you celebrate. Um, I just thank you all for just continuing to partner with Immunize Nevada during these webinars and our presenters. Uh, we take it not for granted that they um, are willing to share and partner. Um, I really love that uh, Katie was on to share from her own experience, which I think is extremely impactful. So again, thank you so much, Katie. Um, and yeah, so again, thank you. I will give everyone back. You have a little bit more of your time today. <laughs> We're finishing a little bit early. Um, but yes, yeah, stay on the lookout for additional programming for 2024. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Everyone have an amazing rest of your day and week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.